Hello everyone. For tonight's talk, we're going to travel far back in the past, at the frontiers of legend and history, and we will explore one of the most famous mythical events ever told, the Trojan War. Or was it just mythical? We'll find out what archaeology can tell us about this too. But let's start immediately with our first story of the night. Once upon a time, so long ago that men almost lost the memory of these events, the king of gods, Zeus, became annoyed at the quantity of humans and half-gods populating the earth. Since he had overthrown his own father, Cronus, and began to rule the earth together with other Olympian gods, men had multiplied, and among them walked too many heroes and demigods born from the relationships between gods and humans. Zeus himself was not the last to get involved with humans. He was unfaithful to his wife, Hera, and from his relationships with mortal women, many children were born. Adding to his worries, he learned from a prophecy that he would be overthrown by one of his sons, like he had overthrown Cronus before, and like Cronus had overthrown his own father, Uranus, at the dawn of times. The threat was serious, and yet another prophecy stated that a son of Thetis, a young and beautiful sea nymph, Zeus had fallen in love with, would become greater than his father. In order to get rid of all these problems, Zeus came up with a plan. First, he ordered Thetis to be married to an elderly king, Peleus, and he made sure all the gods were invited to the wedding. When all the gods arrived, Bringing many gifts, Zeus ordered Hermes, the messenger of God, to stop Eros, the goddess of discord, at the door. Eros was a minor deity, but she had the power of creating strife, of sowing the seeds of discord between gods or between men. Insulted, Eros threw a gift of her own from the door, just like Zeus had expected, a golden apple on which was inscribed, to the fairest. This apple became the most desired prize in the assembly, and three goddesses immediately claimed it for themselves, Athena, Hera, and Aphrodite. They argued over the apple, each of them convinced that it should be theirs. But they couldn't come to an agreement, and none of the other gods would dare to give an opinion in favor of one, for fear of antagonizing the other two. Zeus smiled under his beard, as the first part of his plan was working. Just as expected, he had manipulated the three goddesses into a bitter feud. Eventually, he ordered Hermes to lead the three goddesses to Paris, the prince of Troy, and he ruled that Paris would decide to whom the golden apple should belong. Troy was the most powerful, wealthiest city of all cities, and it was protected by walls so high and so strong that no army could ever dream of defeating the city. 
Paris was a prince of Troy, but he didn't know it. He was raised as a shepherd and kept away from the city because of a prophecy saying that he would be the downfall of Troy. As an anonymous and unknown shepherd, there was no way he could fulfill the prophecy and threaten the powerful city. Led by Hermes, the three goddesses went bathing in a spring and appeared to him naked in their perfection for the sake of winning Paris' approval and get the apple. Paris was unable to decide between them. So, after a while, the goddesses resorted to bribes. Athena offered Paris bravery, wisdom, and the abilities of the greatest warriors. As the goddess of military glory and knowledge, she thought there was no way Paris would refuse. Hera was all about power and influence. She offered Paris control of all Asia and more power a human king had ever had. But Aphrodite, the goddess of beauty and love, also had weapons and she knew the heart of young men. She offered him the love of the most beautiful woman in the world, Helen of Sparta. Helen was married to Menelaus, the king of Sparta, and her legendary beauty was famous all across the known world. Paris couldn't resist, and he awarded the apple to Aphrodite, to the anger of Athena and Hera. He couldn't know it yet. But doing so, he had accomplished Zeus' plan to bring war to the world, and as the prophecy said, he would be the downfall of Troy, and many warriors and heroes would also die because of the folly of gods and men alike. Before we continue our story, I wish you a warm welcome to this new talk. Please make yourself comfortable, either sitting or curling up in your bed, and let the tension in your shoulders be gently released. Tonight, we're going to discover the Iliad the story of the Trojan War by Greek author Homer and we will also explore the reality of Troy because even though Homer's story is a part of Greek mythology these myths are not baseless Troy did exist and its ruins were discovered in the 19th century after centuries when scholars believed that it was purely mythical. Not only were the remains of Troy discovered, but so was a treasure, a lot of artifacts, and a wealth of information about Greek antiquity that led to further discoveries and hypotheses about the early period of Greek civilization. We're going to discuss all this tonight, and because the Trojan War is one of the greatest stories ever told, there will also be a lot of storytelling. If you like that kind of talk about Greek mythology and Greek history, I already have one available about the Twelve Labors of Heracles, and I will soon make another one about the Odyssey, the story of the long journey of King Odysseus 
back home after the Trojan War. You can also listen to my stories on Spotify, Apple Music, Deezer or Amazon. If you would like to support this channel, keep it free of video ads and also download audios and videos. This is possible on my Patreon page. You will find links in the first comment pinned under the video, together with timestamps. This talk is also here to accompany you as you fall asleep, and maybe you will wish to return to it later, where you left. The timestamps are here to help you navigate this long story. Now take a deep breath. You can close your eyes and follow the story easily as long as you let the sound of my voice guide you. Let's return to mythical times. So Paris had granted the golden apple to Aphrodite and his prize would be the love of the most beautiful woman in the world, Helen of Sparta. Helen's beauty was of divine origin. Her father was Zeus himself, and her mother was Leda, a princess who had become a Spartan queen. Zeus was used to trick mortal women into sleeping with him, when he fancied them. To approach Lida, he had taken the form of a white swan. Unafraid by the bird, and seduced by its elegance, the princess had let Zeus have his way with her. From this relationship, Helen was born, and she was raised by the king of Sparta as his daughter. The king ignored he was not her real father. Helen was already a charming child, but as the years went by and she turned into a woman, her beauty grew in fame all around Greece, and she soon had scores of suitors willing to do anything to marry her. Her father was unwilling to choose one of them for fear that all the others would retaliate violently. Among these suitors was Odysseus of Ithaca, an island and one of the numerous kingdoms of Greece. Odysseus may not have been the strongest or the bravest of all the suitors, but he was the most astute. And on top of Helen, he had also set his eyes on another Spartan woman, Penelope. In exchange for the support of the king of his own suit towards Penelope, he came up with a plan that would solve the dilemma. Get Helen married without retaliation from all the other suitors if they wanted to have a chance to be chosen. All suitors would have to swear an oath that they would defend the marriage of Helen, regardless of whom the king would choose. This way, none of them would be able to deny the wedding and retaliate once uh, Helen's husband would have been uh, announced. All the suitors swore the oath to stay in the race, and the king could now make his choice. As promised, Odysseus got his support for his suit of Penelope and could take her back to Ithaca. The king of Sparta chose Menelaus, a man with great wealth and power, Menelaus had promised Aphrodite a sacrifice, a hundred oxen, if he won Helen, and 
he had sent his brother, Agamemnon, petition for her. His wealth and influence made him a good political choice. However, Menelaus forgot about his promise of a sacrifice to Aphrodite, and the goddess became irritated at him. Helen had two brothers, Castor and Pollux, and one sister, Clytemnestra. One of the brothers should have inherited the throne of Sparta, but they became gods, both of them, and so the throne went to Helen's husband, Menelaus. This is how Menelaus became the new king of Sparta after the death of Helen's father. Clytemnestra, Helen's sister, was married to Agamemnon, Menelaus' brother, and Agamemnon became king of Mycenae, another Greek kingdom. It seemed all was well. The two brothers had married the two sisters, succession issues were solved, and Menelaus couldn't be happier with his beautiful wife. But they ignored Zeus' plan, the feud between goddesses, and the judgment of Paris, which had led to Helen being promised by Aphrodite to the Trojan prince. By promising Helen to Paris, Aphrodite had not only won the contest for the golden apple, she had also taken revenge on Menelaus for forgetting about his promise to sacrifice a hundred oxen in her honor. As these events unfolded in Sparta, Paris had returned to Troy, now knowing that he was a prince of the city, and he had been recognized as such. It was now time for him to claim his prize, the love of Helen of Sparta. Troy was not a part of the Greek world. The Greeks, or Achaeans, these are synonyms, lived in and around the Peloponnese, and on islands on either side of it, in the Ionian and Aegean seas. Troy was a foreign city and kingdom, in the east, on the coasts of Anatolia. So, under the cover of a diplomatic mission, Paris travelled to Sparta, while King Menelaus was away. He had gone to greet. Aphrodite was watching, ready to deliver Helen to Paris. Just before Paris entered the royal palace in Sparta, she instructed her son, Eros, the little winged god of desire, to shoot an arrow at Helen. The arrows of Eros made people fall immediately in love with the next person they saw, and made them physically attracted in a way that couldn't be suppressed. As soon as Helen saw Paris, she fell in love with him. Taking advantage of the king's absence, the two lovers sailed to Troy. Zeus and other gods watched these events from Mount Olympus, and the king of gods was satisfied with how the seeds of discord he had manipulated Eros into sowing were now beginning to flourish. One of the most powerful Achaean kings, the king of Sparta, Menelaus, had been humiliated by a foreigner, taking his wife with her consent. And all of Helen's suitors had sworn to defend her marriage to Menelaus, following Odysseus' trick to make them accept it. They were now bound to take part in the inevitable war that would oppose the Achaeans and the Trojans to take back Helen and restore Menelaus' honor. 
in a desperate attempt to avoid the war. Menelaus traveled to Troy with his closest ally, Odysseus. They tried to recover Helen by diplomatic means, but it failed. The war was now about to begin. There are still many events and characters yet to intervene. But let's pause for a moment and take a look at the historicity of all this. The primary source of the story of the Trojan War is an ancient Greek epic poem called the Iliad, attributed to Homer together with the Odyssey, also attributed to Homer. These two poems are the central works of ancient Greek literature. There is no doubt that these texts are ancient. They are dated to around the 8th century BC, when their oldest known written form appeared. But we don't know for sure whether Homer existed, or whether he is a legendary figure. Some scholars believe he was a genius poet and author, the first ever in Western history to leave his name attached to literary works. Others favor the hypothesis that the Iliad and the Odyssey are the result of a process of working and reworking by many different contributors. In that case, Homer would be just a legendary figure created to embody this literary tradition. The poems are written in epic or Homeric Greek, which was a literary language in the 8th century BC. The ancient Greek language was far from unified. There were various dialects, and uh, like in Chinese languages or in Arabic, there was a literary form of writing that was quite different from the way people actually spoke in everyday life. In Western countries, in modern times, this distinction between spoken and written languages has uh, diminished a lot. We still don't write exactly as we speak, and when we do it sounds very informal. But there is no longer the kind of major distinction between the spoken vernacular and the written form that existed centuries ago in other languages a big distinction between two forms, two registers of the language, still exist. I gave the example of Arabic before. There are many Arabic-speaking countries, but people actually learn distinct varieties or registers of the language when they grow up. One is the Arabic dialect spoken in the country, in everyday life, and even in the most of the national media. These dialects have diverged with uh, time and distance, and nowadays someone from Morocco or Algeria would have a hard time communicating with another Arabic speaker from the Persian Gulf in their respective dialects. But there is also a more formal register called Modern Standard Arabic, which directly comes from Classical Arabic. And this one is identical all across the Arabic-speaking world. It is used as the official language and in written communication. It is also the register taught in schools and used for every formal situation. The mastering of standard Arabic is uh, an indicator of how educated people are, but the vast majority of Arabic speakers can navigate to some extent 
between the uh, everyday informal dialect and the literary form of Arabic. It has now been strongly attenuated, but English had the same kind of distinction between uh, an elevated literary language and a colloquial form that was spoken every day. In the 11th century, 1000 years ago, there was an old form of English that served as the official and literary language, but it was displaced by Latin and the Old French after the Norman conquest of England. This didn't make the spoken English disappear and England had completely different languages coexisting at the time, depending on whether it was spoken or written, and on the level of formality. A standardized literary English emerged over the following centuries, replacing Latin, and it became dominant by the end of the Middle Ages. But as it developed, in the Middle Ages and into the Renaissance, it absorbed a lot of terms from classical languages, from Latin, from Greek, from Old French. And through this process, many words, many terms with a Latin root made their way into the common English and have remained a part of it. This is why English speakers can easily recognize many words in a French, Italian or Spanish text. These Latin-based terms arrived via literary English. And then over the past two or three centuries, all Western countries have gone through a process of merger between the two registers. Something of this remains. We don't exactly write as we speak, but for several centuries already, Western languages have lost this uh, distinction between uh, the uh, everyday and uh, the literary registers. So that was a long digression. So let's return to uh, Homer. I was telling you that the uh, Iliad and the Odyssey were written in a uh, literary form of ancient Greek, and that Homer may or may not be a single author. Ancient Greeks believed that the Iliad had exaggerated events for the sake of poetry and storytelling, but they didn't question the historicity of the Trojan War. They thought it had happened several centuries before the time of classical Greece, around 1200 BC. But did they also believe in the myth, the gods intervening in uh, human affairs, and the uh, heroes walking the world? It's hard to know for sure, but classical writings seem to indicate that the population actually believed them to be generally real even though people were unsure about some of the uh, details that might have been exaggerated by storytellers. The educated uh, elite was more split. Some believed that there was a part of truth. Others rejected mythology as superstition or an equivalent to fairy tales. But all across Greece, Mythology was respected because it unified people, and it was culture, too. There was no strict distinction between mythology, literature, theater. A lot of activities and traditions in ancient Greece were deeply rooted in religion and mythology, from the legitimacy of city-states to the economic activities of temples, to a theater or the Olympic Games. It was in nobody's interest to attack the myth, and uh, so they were passed from generation to generation, with uh, new authors adding uh, new uh, anecdotes to them. So mythology never stopped evolving. 
that the core of Greek mythology that was present in classical Greece probably started to emerge 1000 years before, around the 18th century BC. It was transmitted orally for centuries until it began to be put in writing, as far as we know, around the 8th century BC, the time of the Iliad and Odyssey. The importance of this body of stories cannot be underestimated, and maybe you've noticed that they often sound very familiar, even when we don't know them. This is because they are the basis for a large part of Western storytelling tradition, and these stories have been rewritten, retold countless times. They keep being retold nowadays with different characters and different settings. Just, for example, think about what I told you earlier of the story. You may have recognized the storyline of Sleeping Beauty. Goddess Eros is banned from a wedding and takes revenge with a curse. This is exactly the bad fairy Maleficent cursing the princess because she was not invited. Zeus multiple affairs, the attempts at revenge by Hera against Heracles the rivalries between gods and goddesses, the uh, initiatory journeys of heroes, the misunderstandings leading to dramatic consequences, the cautionary tales. We know all of this. We see it in movies and TV shows. We read it in novels and comic books. There are a lot of universal elements in these that are found in many cultures around the world. But when it comes to the storytelling traditions in the West and in the Middle East too, they were fixed and put in writing at the time of ancient Greece, primarily in mythology and stories like the Trojan War. So let's return to our story. Troy had refused to deliver Helen back to Menelaus, and the war was now unavoidable, as all the Greeks, all the Achaean kingdoms, were bound by oath to defend the marriage of Helen and the king of Sparta. Menelaus asked his brother, Agamemnon, the king of Mycenae, to uphold his oath, Agamemnon agreed, and sent emissaries to all Achaean kingdoms to ask them to observe their oath. No Greek warrior or hero could ignore the call. Among them was Ajax. Ajax was a, a great-grandson of Zeus and a famous warrior. He was a colossus known to be fearless in combat. Another hero the Greeks counted on was Achilles. And Achilles was no stranger to this story, because he was the son of Thetis, the nymph who had been married to an elderly king at the beginning of our story. The same wedding when Zeus had plotted to have Eros, so discord among the goddesses with the golden apple. Achilles had been the subject of prophecies before the war even began. One said that he would either die of old age after an uneven full and happy life, or die young in a battlefield and gain immortality through poetry. When he was a child, another prophecy announced that Troy could never fall without his support. This last prophecy was told by Calchas, an augur from the city of Argos. Calchas was a seer. 
he could receive knowledge of the past, the present, and the future from God Apollo, and he also joined the Achaean army. Thetis was very fond of her son Achilles, and she tried to make him immortal. She went to the Styx, the river that ran to the underworld, and she bathed him in it when he was still an infant. This made Achilles invulnerable wherever he was touched by the water of the Styx. But she had held him by the heel, meaning that this small part of Achilles' body had remained mortal and vulnerable to injury. After this, Achilles grew up to be the greatest of all mortal warriors. He was not only strong, fast and agile, he was also brave and perfectly confident in his abilities. He had been sent to the centaur Chiron to be trained, together with Ajax, and no other warrior in Greece would have been foolish enough to defy him. But his mother knew the prophecies, especially the one that promised him to die young in battle, and as soon as the word of the upcoming war with Troy spread across Greece, she was terrified for his life. So she had hidden him on the island of Skyros, in the Aegean Sea, at the court of King Lycomedes. When the emissaries arrived, Odysseus and Ajax, Thetis disguised her son as a woman, hoping they would not find him. But they did. They blew a horn, which happened when invaders were arriving. And instead of fleeing, Achilles seized a spear and prepared for combat. He was found out, and to the despair of his mother, he decided to join the Achaean army. The Greek forces gathered, and Calchas the ogre was among them. A sacrifice was made to Apollo to attract his favors and know what the future held. After the sacrifice, a snake slithered from Apollo's altar to a tree, where there was a sparrow's nest. The snake ate the mother sparrow and her nine chicks before turning to stone. Calchas interpreted this as a sign that Troy would fall, but only in the tenth year of the war. The way to Troy was by the sea, beyond the Aegean Sea, and to carry Greek forces, an immense fleet of more than a thousand ships had been gathered. But as they set sail to Anatolia, a storm scattered the fleet and ended the invasion before it even began. It took eight long years to gather it again, but the determination of Menelaus, Agamemnon and their allies like Odysseus paid off. Eight years later, the fleet was ready again. It comprised 1,200 galleys, each with dozens of warriors from all over Greece, mainland Greece, the Peloponnese, the Aegean Islands, Crete, Ithaca. A hundred thousand men ready to attack the most formidable city in the known world. But as the fleet was ready to depart, the winds ceased completely, in a way that was unnatural and suspicious. Could some of the gods be against the Greeks? Calchas the prophet was called to explain what was happening. He revealed that Artemis, 
the goddess of the hunt and the wild animals, daughter of Zeus and sister of Apollo, was punishing Agamemnon. Agamemnon had killed a sacred deer and boasted that he was a better hunter than Artemis herself. She had been irritated by his actions and bragging and had decided to make him pay. Chalcus also revealed that the only way to appease Artemis was to sacrifice the own daughter of Agamemnon, Iphigenia. Agamemnon refused initially, but there was no other way if he wanted to lead the expedition and uh, observe his oath to his brother. So he finally performed the sacrifice. A more vengeful goddess like Hera would have certainly let the sacrifice happen. But Artemis had a good heart. So at the last moment, she took pity on the girl. She took her to be a maiden in one of her temples, and she replaced her with a lamp. Iphigenia was saved, the winds returned, and finally the Achaeans could set sail to Troy. The Iliad is famous for telling the story of the Trojan War, but not in the way I'm telling you at the moment. The Iliad actually covers only a few weeks of the war, near the end but it also alludes to many events that happened before. The Odyssey also brings more elements, and the rest is a long tradition shaped by many authors over the centuries. There are often different versions of some episodes. I have chosen one for tonight, but variations exist. We are now going to see events that happened over the first nine years of the war, before the Iliad begins. The Greeks had gathered forces from their many kingdoms, but Troy also had allies. From Anatolia, from Thrace, many peoples had answered its call for help. The Trojan alliance was no less formidable than the Greeks. This was not just a fight against a city. It was a fight of the Greek world against barbarians and the eastern peoples gathered under the Trojan banner. Two worlds were about to start fighting. From Mount Olympus, Zeus watched with satisfaction his plan unraveling. The earth would be cleaned of its too many warriors and demigods, spawned by himself and other gods. And this was a divine conflict, too. On the Greek side, Hera and Athena, the two angry goddesses that had lost the golden apple to Aphrodite, on the Trojan side, Aphrodite, Poseidon, the god of the seas, and Apollo, who would hit the Greeks later, we'll see how. And the Trojans also had their heroes. The most notable of these heroes was Hector, son of Priam and brother of Paris. Priam was the old king of Troy. He had fathered many children, including princes Hector and Paris, and also Diphobus and Helenus. Hector commanded the Trojan army and also was a terrific warrior, on a par with Greek heroes like Ajax or Achilles. Calchas, the ogre, had made a prophecy about the arrival of the Achaeans. 
the first of them to walk on Trojan land, would also be the first to die. Obviously, no one dared to step off a ship, knowing this. Once again, Odysseus solved and saved the situation with one of his tricks. He threw his shield to the beach and landed on it. Another Greek, Protesilaus, saw this and thought Odysseus had landed first, so he did too. But in fact, Odysseus had not really walked on Trojan land since he was uh, standing on his shield. So it was uh, Protesilos who fell victim of the prophecy. Soon after landing, he engaged in single combat with Hector and was killed by the Trojan leader. However, things went rather well for the Greeks on this first day. They killed many Trojans and occupied the beach, whereas the Trojans fled to the safety of the walls of their city. The walls were the most formidable in the world. They were so high and so strong that legend attributed their build to gods Poseidon and Apollo themselves. Following the retreat of the Trojans behind the walls, the Greeks besieged Troy for the nine following years. The walls were so big that an assault was unthinkable, and the city was so large that it couldn't be entirely circled, meaning that Troy could still receive supplies. In the hope of forcing the Trojans out, the Greeks sent armies led by heroes like uh, Ajax and Achilles, raid lands of Trojan allies. Achilles raided several cities, and among the loot from these cities, he brought back a slave, Briseis, of remarkable beauty. Agamemnon also captured another seducing slave, Chryseis. But the Trojans would still not exit the safety of their walls knowing that time was on their side, because the Achaeans could not afford to stay far away from their kingdoms forever. And this strategy began to pay off. By the end of the ninth year, a mutiny erupted in the Greek army. Thousands of warriors refused to obey their leaders and demanded to return to their homes. It took the aura of Achilles to convince them to stay for now. But the worst was still to come for the Achaeans. And this is the moment when the tale from the Iliad begins in the tenth year of the siege. The father of Chryseus, the slave captured by Agamemnon, was a priest of Apollo. He came to Agamemnon to ask for the return of his daughter. Agamemnon refused and insulted the priest, which enraged Apollo himself. The god afflicted the Achaean army with plague, forcing its leader to return Chryseis to her father. As compensation for the loss of the slave, Agamemnon used his position to take Achilles' slave, Briseis. Insulted and enraged by this, Achilles decided he would no longer fight, and he withdrew from the war for now. Seeing the morale of their enemies shaken, the Trojans decided it was time to end the siege. So, for the first time since the landing, both armies faced each other. A duel was agreed between two champions, Menelaus of Sparta and Paris of Troy, the two men who initially fought for Helen. Paris was no match for Menelaus, 
and was beaten. To save his life, goddess Aphrodite snatched him from the field, refusing to let the man who had chosen her to die. The two armies began fighting again under the city's walls. On each side, warriors and heroes gave all they have to root their enemies, inspired by gods who supported their sides. Inspired by Athena, Greek king Diomedes even wounded goddess Aphrodite herself. Thousands fell this day, but ultimately the battle ended inconclusively. During the following days, the Trojans exploited this psychological advantage and the absence of Achilles to drive back the Greeks to their camp. Achilles observed what was happening from afar. Following tradition, Greek warriors were paired with a companion. They were best friends and sometimes lovers. Achilles' companion, who was also his relative, was Patroclus. And following Achilles' withdrawal from the war, Patroclus had also withdrawn to stay with him. Patroclus wanted to fight, and seeing the progress made by the Trojans, Achilles allowed him to do so, wearing his armor and leading his army. The next day, Patroclus covered himself in glory. Leading the Greeks, he drove back the Trojans to their city and saved an apparently desperate situation. The Greeks were inspired by this man they thought to be Achilles, since Patroclus was wearing his armor. As the Trojans re-entered their city in chaos, Patroclus was even close to storm it, as the Trojans would not have time to close the doors. But at this moment, fate and the will of gods hit. Apollo stopped the Achaeans from entering Troy, and Hector appeared, starting a fight with Patroclus, thinking he was Achilles. Patroclus didn't have the strength of his companion, and couldn't beat the best Trojan hero. He was defeated and killed by Hector. After the death of their leader, in this counter-attack, the Greeks let the Trojans return to their city. Once again, the situation was in a dead end. But Achilles was maddened with grief over the death of Patroclus. He swore to kill Hector in revenge and this meant re-entering the war. He was reconciled with Agamemnon and received Briseis back from the Greek king. His armor and set of weapons had been lost because Patroclus used them. So he received new ones forged by Hephaestus, the god of metalworking and artisans himself. On the next day, he killed many Trojans on the battlefield and nearly killed a Trojan hero, Aeneas, who was saved at the last minute by Poseidon. Once again, the Trojan army returned to the city, but goddess Athena, protector of Achilles, was watching. She disoriented Hector and made him stay outside. The two most formidable heroes of the war, Achilles and Hector, now faced each other. Achilles burning with hate at the killer of Patroclus. An epic fight followed. Achilles inspired by Athena and Hector by Apollo and Aphrodite. But no one could vanquish Achilles in a duel. And that day, Hector was defeated and killed. Blinded by hate, Achilles dragged Hector's body from his chariot 
and refused to return it to the Trojans for burial. Old King Priam of Troy was devastated by the loss of his favorite son, and afterwards he was guided by Hermes, the messenger god, to Achilles' tent, where he begged for the return of Hector's body. Touched by the sorrow of a grieving father, Achilles agreed and gave the body back, after which a funeral could be organized for Hector. But the war went on. Troy was still resisting, even after the loss of its leader. In a further battle, once, Achilles managed to enter the city with a small group of Achaeans. At this point, when he broke in, the gods gathered and argued over Achilles. He had killed so many, including many of their children, that several gods thought his time to die had come. Mortals, even heroes, are of little importance to gods, and they agreed on this. Inspired by Apollo, Paris hit Achilles with a poisonous arrow in the heel, the only part of his body that could be wounded. The hero vacillated as poison runs through his veins and collapsed. On this day, the prophecy announcing that he would die young and become immortal through poetry was fulfilled. Achilles was no more, but 3,000 years after, he still lives in memories. With Achilles dead, the Greeks had lost their best hero, and the war was still not over. The end of the war came with one final ruse, and after years of fighting, hate, violence and revenge, it is not force, but ruse that ended it. Odysseus devised a ruse, a plan. A giant, hollow wooden horse, in which himself and a group of soldiers would hide. The next day, when the Trojans woke up, they saw the beach empty of soldiers, and the immense fleet of the Greeks had gone. The Achaeans had apparently withdrawn from the war. Only the giant horse on wheels stayed on the beach. Believing the war was finally over and filled with joy, the Trojans dragged the horse into their city. Several voices warned against keeping it, saying that it should be burnt but Athena made sure they were ignored. The Trojans decided to keep the horse as a trophy and uh, turned to a night of celebration. To them, the war was finally over and they had prevailed. Or had they? Because in the middle of the night, when the moon was full, the Achaean's fleet returned. Odysseus and his men emerged from the horse and uh, killed the guards and then they opened the doors to the Greek army. The Greeks entered the city that night and killed the sleeping population. The sack of Troy continued into the day. The Greeks were filled with rage after ten years of pointless fighting. They committed a massacre and even threw Hector's infant Astyanax down from the walls of Troy to end the royal line. More innocent than ever died, and the most powerful city in the world fell. 
the story of Troy was over. But history never ends. A few survivors, led by Trojan hero Aeneas, went on a journey that ended in Italy, where they settled. This story is told in the Aeneid by Roman author Virgil. He is the one who made the Trojan horse legendary, as the horse doesn't appear in the Iliad that ends before the fall of Troy. Greek kings went back to their lands on difficult journeys, especially Odysseus. This is the story of the Odyssey that I will tell you another time. Through the Iliad and multiple other texts that were written later, the Trojan War remained continuously famous during the Antiquity, the Middle Ages and to our days. It was widely believed to be historical in the Antiquity, but in the West, as it was a part of Greek mythology, it became increasingly seen as a myth, among others, in the 19th century. Scholars considered Troy to be purely mythical, or being a story made of several different stories. Until, in the 1860s, under the ruins of a Roman city, which itself had been built on a Greek settlement, the ruins of a large city from the Bronze Age, corresponding to the location and period indicated in the Iliad, were discovered. On the site, a lot of artifacts made of copper, silver, gold, were unearthed. They have been called Priam's treasure, after the name of the legendary King of Troy. Most of them were actually found on a part of the site that doesn't correspond to the Bronze Age city, so it is far from sure they are related to the ancient Troy. But still, they are well-preserved, ancient, and a remarkable archaeological treasure. So, Troy did exist in the Bronze Age. We have no way of knowing whether the Trojan War was fictional, or really happened, and was exaggerated, or was a combination of several wars. But what we do know is that a city existed there, and long before the supposed dates of the Trojan War, the ancient Greeks estimated the war happened around 1200 BC, but the earliest remains excavated at Troy are from 3000 BC, and archaeological studies on the site indicate that the city was destroyed around the 12th century BC, at a time that corresponds to the mythical Trojan War. And more broadly, the dates correspond to a widespread phenomenon in the Near East called the Late Bronze Age Collapse. About at the same time between 1200 BC and 1150 BC, ancient Greek kingdoms, Babylonia, the Hittite Empire in Anatolia, the Egyptian Empire, they all collapsed politically and culturally. Trade routes were interrupted, cities were abandoned, and the Dark Age started for centuries in various parts of the Eastern Mediterranean. We don't know exactly the reasons. It could be a temporary change in the climate, maybe caused by volcanic eruptions, it could be invasions, or the effects of iron-based metallurgy that began to spread and maybe led to wars, or maybe just a series of coincidences. But it happened, and maybe 
The story of the Trojan War is an expression of this collapse that shook the early Greek world and from which the Greeks needed several centuries to recover fully. As always, mythology is never entirely made up. It has roots in reality. It is a way to explain history, society, and the human experience. This is all for today. I hope you enjoyed our journey to the past and to the world of mythology. You can now fall into a restful sleep or pick another story. I will talk to you soon with a new one. Sweet dreams. Au revoir.